For Talata's death was the start of a long journey for Nomonde. Reeling from the death of her husband while pregnant with her third child, the young mother still endured constant harassment from the apartheid state. She testified before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but even to this day, doesn't have any real closure. No one has been held accountable for the torture and murder of the Craddock Four. These incredibly traumatic events help shape each member of the family in very different ways. Between the siblings, mm. you really are the bearer of most of the memories of your father. I am, and it's very funny how we talk about these things when we are together. So 1985, during that time, when he disappeared, I was nine, and then I turned 10 before he could be buried. So my birthday always sort of signifies that period when that transpired. Yes, and I do have a lot of memories, good ones and bad ones, you know. Not bad ones created by him, but bad memories about what he had to go through. And I had to see that. I had to witness that. I think I, I talked about like the fact that I'm doing a study at Stellenbosch. And I'm doing it on the narratives of the Kredok for widows and their children, whom I'm calling the political orphans. Because one of the things that has always struck me was, how did my mom and them and all the other widows of politicians, how did they cope with what has happened to them? And that is such, that is such a big question. Mm. It's a heavy how. Mm. How? How? You know, how did they cope? How did they get past yes. exactly. or get through what exactly. happened to them? Because one of the things I'm actually saying is that when you heard how she was talking now about people expect her to continue doing what my father was doing. And I looked at that and I'm saying, but that is like a perpetuation of political widowhood, you know, because to be a political widow is not like any other widow. Some other widows get time to mourn and heal, and they're given space to forget about this. I think that's for me is, is really the big question is, what, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of having to revisit this all the time? On the one hand, I know it's healing. On the other hand, it's also a reminder. And I'm saying, is there a balance? And where can we create this balance? There's also something that says, but we need to tell these stories. Mm. We need to be able to tell people that, unlike maybe the people in the Holocaust, we as South Africans have found healing by nature of South Africa being South Africa. By the mere fact that my mother had other women who would come in when she gets incarcerated and come and say to me, Dorothy, stand on the stoop. Scream and shout loudly, Mama, come back. Mama, come back. You're going to see, we're going to get together and she's going to come back. And those are the memories that I have. It's like the minute the police would come to our house at night, the people in the street, the clue to them was I had to go out and sing. And sing. Very so loud. I would get out mm -hmm. and sing very loudly. Mm -hmm. Whatever song comes to, to mind. Remember my dad had a band, so I used to sing with him in the band too. That's another nice memory that I share that, you know, Lukanya and them though wouldn't remember because they were so much younger. So I would sing. The minute I sing at night, people would know that the police are there. The memory of when you were first told, Manu Munde, mm that your husband had been murdered. Yes. I don't want to say that he died mm. because he was murdered. Mm. Yes. And what we're told about that moment in your life is that Lucania had a Lucania. physical reaction and, yeah. and you and started, started singing. Started to sing. mm. She started to sing and uh, I couldn't understand that is she really, did she heard these people what they just said and for a moment, I could not cry because it was just, it just went like blank, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know. I was like blank. 
and here is my little boy sick here next to me and this one is singing loudly and the house is full of people and then <sighs> mm. But there was a story it was, to just, the was just blank. And then Dorothy, mm -hmm. Dorothy just kept on singing. Do you remember singing. that there was, a, there was a story to the singing, though. There was a story to the singing because my dad and them have been lost for some days, yes. right? And up until that point, you were still hoping yes. Yes, yes. That, they would, yes, that, they, that they would come, come back. back. That yeah. maybe, you know, they were incarcerated. Or even that they have skipped the country, country. because mm. that, those were one of the things that mm. could happen then. But at the time, I used to have these dreams that really used to bother me. I would get this feeling when I'm no longer going to see somebody. But I, was, I had this dream of my dad burning and, and being mutilated. You know, I had a terrible dream. I couldn't tell my mom this dream. And you were a nine-year-old little yes. girl. And I couldn't tell my mom this dream. She knew about that sixth sense. And then she kept on asking me, what are you feeling? But I couldn't tell her what I was feeling. Couldn't tell her. I just told her I can't sense my dad. I can't, I can't sense him. Because I used to know when they're coming back, you know, I would like sort of get up and go open the door before he arrives at home because I could sense that he's close to the house. And so I couldn't sense. And I was like, no, I can't sense. Can't sense. But she was like, are you sensing something bad? or something?" I was like, I can't sense. And I've already had my dream. And I couldn't tell her about my dream. And um, on this particular afternoon, I went to prayer. I was attending girls' prayer at the Anglican church. So I went to the prayer meeting like usual. You know, I went to church. And then older people came to fetch me from the prayer meeting which was a clue to me that something might have happened. Uh, my mom was at my grand's house by then already. Heavily pregnant. Heavily pregnant. And then I get into the house, it's full of people. So when the, new, when the tide was broken, I was from church. That burst into song was probably my way of releasing the tension because the tension was already built up by them going to fetch me from church, bringing me here. We get here, everybody's quiet, it's just somber. And they were just waiting for me. I was the only person who was missing so that this could be told. So when I got in, it was like I got in and I got into this tension. And then they said it and I burst into song because Song was maybe my way of dealing with issues. Song was my way of announcing. Mm. And song was my way of saying there's danger. So, yeah. And, the, and, and people picked up the song. It was a hymn that I sang. And, and, and people picked up the hymn. And I guess for a moment I was holding everyone because they kept singing and kept singing and kept singing until they could cry. Mm. Some of them could cry and, you know, and it announced, I think more than the, the announcement of the death, the song announced the death. And I carried that, literally. And when I broke into song, everybody could break. Because some were singing indeed, some were crying, you know. And what I remembered as a child was that song went on and on and on and on until maybe people could eventually get to realize what it was that was happening. And I think since then, song has really become a... Even prior to that, songs were a big part of my life because when we, when we still stayed at my grand-grandmother's with my parents, you know, when, when, when we would uh, clean the house, what, I would be the one who's singing. Mm. When I wake up in the morning, I would sing. So mm. people used to call me the clock, mm. that they would know that, okay, Dorothy's up now, so mm. it means it's six o'clock, we need to <laughs> get up and we need to. Mm. But song has actually become a very big part of, okay. of me. When the police comes to the house in the morning, uh, maybe to come and 
a get for. Dorothy will wake up. She will take out her school shoes, knowing that she's not going to go to school, and brush the shoes and sing and sing. And they will say, you are making a big noise. Dorothy will sing and sing until they take Fort out or maybe they question Le him or leave him. leave him. Yeah. I want to stay in that moment of you first being told of your husband's murder. Mm. As a mother of two, a third baby is on the way. And the advice that you're getting, even from your own comrades, is don't break down. Yeah. Stay strong. Yeah. You cannot let them know that they have hurt you. Yeah. Yeah, that was terrible. That was the most terrible thing. I wanted to cry because my husband had died. My friend, my brother have passed away. He, he's not there. He's been murdered. But I have to pose as if nothing is happening. I remember uh, the one afternoon when I have to go and see the doctor. And then my brother-in-law came and said to me, listen, you must not cry. You must not show any emotions on your face. But deep down in my heart, I'm hurt. I need to cry. I need to show that I am hurting, mm. but I can't. I had to wash and, you know, clean my face and walk up straight with this pain in me. We went and we got to the doctor's rooms. Yeah, the doctor's rooms are full of security branch police. How am I not supposed to cry when I see these people that I know that they have murdered my husband. I know that they are happy because they have succeeded. But I have to go in there and my doctor came in and I went to the rooms and doctor examined me. After examining me and doctor um, asked me, oh, sorry, Mrs. Kalata, who do you think have you killed, killed your, your husband? husband? And I said, the police, of course. And I said, no, you can't say that. What about the Azapo? You know? And then I said, no, the Azapo could not have killed my husband because they had nothing against my husband. The police was harassing us. The police is harass was harassing my husband. So I think they killed my husband. And at that time, I so much wanted to cry, but then I have to hold in. That is why sometimes I think even today, that is why I'm still crying. Because I never had the moment to mourn for the death of my husband. I never had the moment to mourn for, the, some, for somebody that I loved so much. And maybe that is why today I'm still feeling the pain. I still feel that the loss feels like it happened yesterday because I was never given the opportunity to cry over him. I remember when he arrived that morning at home, with this red coffin, you know, it was unbelievable. And uh, Lucanio was keep on telling me, listen, let's move out of the door, the back door. You see that bus standing there? He is there. Let's get in. He can drive and just get away. And I said, your father is not there. He's in the red coffin. He said, no, I just saw him. He was here among these people. He showed me that I must come. He went into that bus. And that was hurtful. But I couldn't cry. You know, I so much wanted to ask, can't you open the coffin so that I can see, is he really in there? But it, people kept on saying, no, you can't see him. He's, you know, you must stay with the picture that you had of him. He's badly burned. He's badly burned. He's mm. terrible. And I, I'm still, you know, uh, you know, wanting to see him, wanting to know how did he look like. I still have that thing, was it him? Is it really him? Was he really in that coffin? Is it really him who died there? And 
after that, I still had to sit up with, uh, with Lucano, blaming me for allowing people to put that coffin into that grave. And on top of it, to put all the soil, the soil on his father, suffocate him. And I was there, I didn't say anything. He's still blaming me after that, uh, about that. I had to deal with that and try to explain to him why it happened, you know. But as I already indicated that everything that I do for my children, for other people, I'm doing it in honor of my husband. I'm doing it for him. I'm keeping strong for him. Everything that I do, I'm doing it for him. I'm showing him, I'm standing for you. I'll be there for you. Come, rain or shine, I will be there for you. Mm -hmm. I will do what you will do for your people. I'll try and do whatever I can. I'm doing it for him. Why did they have to mutilate him after they have killed him? Killing him was enough. 